All right. Thank you so much for joining. I hope you're enjoying day two of the summit. My name is Amina Patton. I am a senior academic partnerships manager here at Force Hero. Um, and it's really exciting for me to introduce you to today's session, Asynchronous, Not Apart, Strategies for Inclusive and Accessible Online Education, which will be led by Who Say Not To, Blake, who I'm very excited to have bring to the stage. Before I let her on to give her speech. I want to make sure that we handle a couple of housekeeping um, things. One, we have plenty of engagement happening in the chat today, which is fantastic. So keep coming in with your ideas, your comments, your feedback. But when it comes to questions, I'm asking you to use the Q&A function in Zoom. You see it at the bottom. This way we can ensure that your questions don't get lost. We know how chats can get in Zoom rooms. So make sure as questions comes up, as I'm sure they will, drop them into the Q&A and who's, who say not to, we'll get to them at the end of the session. And without further ado, I hand the mic over to her. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for attending this session. And I wanna thank Course Hero for the invitation. Um, today, before we delve into things, I do wanna give a short introduction of myself. Um, my name is Susanatu Blake. I am a professor that teaches 100% asynchronously. Um, I'm an adjunct professor at the Middlebury Institute of International Studies, where I teach global ed for the future to graduate students looking to enter the ed tech sector. And I am the former adjunct professor of business law at Baltimore City Community College, where I really got my feet wet in um, teaching students asynchronously. And these, these were students from so many different types of backgrounds. And it really has prepared me to give this type of presentation. So I will share my presentation and we will get started. Please let me know if you cannot see my screen, but I'm assuming that everyone can, okay? Well, um, before we jump in, I do wanna gauge the audience, right? So I am going to present a poll question just to get us started. And the poll question that you will see popping up on your screens, will really be a focus on how many of you all have experience in teaching asynchronously. And it will give me a gauge on where you guys are, what your starting point is and what your perspectives are. So I'll give you a second. I see so many popping in. And as anticipated, it's a mix so far. I'll give it a few more seconds. There's still about 20 or so of you who haven't responded. I'll give you just a few more seconds to click. Oh. All right, I'm gonna end the poll and I'm gonna share the results. So many of you, have a mixture of asynchronous and secret synchronous teaching, um, which is really on trend with what we're seeing today in higher ed. Um, but there are a few of you with no online teaching experience, which is very, very interesting. And I hope that you find this presentation beneficial for what you hopefully um, plan on doing in the future when you delve into online teaching. 
So a bit of an overview of what I will be speaking about today. Um, for the ones who don't have online teaching experience, I'm going to go over a little bit about asynchronous teaching, what the landscape is today. And then I will go into the three main areas that I believe will help um, professors when teaching asynchronously. And that is setting a tone for respectful dialogue, um, diversifying your curriculum perspective, and using the emerging technologies. It is a necessary thing. And then I will conclude by sharing insights and lessons using an acronym that is very, very helpful to me um, when I'm designing my courses. So let's jump into it. First and foremost, asynchronous teaching. What is the landscape? Many of you know it to be um, the definition that's provided here, really providing your students with a sequence of units, designing a course where they can engage and complete assignments and learn at their own pace, time, and location. Um, we are in a setting, especially after the COVID pandemic, where most students are opting to learn um, asynchronously. And what we're seeing around the country is that many colleges and universities are creating online only programs and departments. So for example, I teach at Middlebury Institute. My department, which is the International Education Management Department, is 100% online and asynchronous. So none of the courses that are offered in my particular department actually is synchronous or in-person. So that is a growing trend amongst many university and colleges, and especially at community colleges where you have a very diverse student body with different schedules, needs, um, and constraints. So being able to teach asynchronously and providing an inclusive environment is going to be essential for most professors. Um, there are some challenges, right? Um, there are a good amount of faculty that do not have experience teaching online, let alone asynchronously. Um, as you all know, there is a different skill set that is required of professors when you are teaching asynchronously. Um, it's a skill set that requires the teacher to anticipate the needs of your students, um, finding different and multiple ways of engaging your student and keeping your students engaged with one another and with you. And so um, there is so many opportunities for professors to learn, to upskill um, themselves in becoming a better professor in this particular field. Um, and also personalizing some of the material for your students who may be non-traditional learners. So what do I normally start with? When designing an asynchronous course, I think about inclusivity and accessibility the first thing, right? And usually I think about setting a tone for respectful dialogue. Oftentimes when people think about asynchronous courses, they're not thinking about dialogue. That's not the first thing on their mind. They think about learning objectives, assessments, you know, content and schedule and the syllabi, but they never think about instructional strategies on setting the tone for dialogue. And believe it or not, these, this particular aspect of um, asynchronous teaching is essential for an inclusive environment. You have to think about dialogue because that is what you want. And usually I tend to start my courses with a set of ground rules, but I'm not setting the ground rules. I have my students set the ground rules. And that really, one, allows them to have a say in what and how they learn. 
um, and two, and how they interact with one another and how I interact with them. Um, but three, it also let, but two, it also lets me know how, what I should be paying attention to on the onset. So for example, in my course at um, Middlebury, um, I usually provide the students with a Padlet link. I use the EdTech tool called Padlet. Um, it's really a bulletin board and it allows for asynchronous discussion. And I really give them a, a set of questions that kind of prompts them to think and start to think of what, what rules they need or so, what parameters they need in place to have a great educational um, experience in my class. And so once they use that link, you start to see so many um, rules that they would like to see in place when they are interacting with their peers. Um, so for example, I've had students um, write about, I need captions. Those are basic things, right? Um, I want my camera turned off because I am, um, um, I am not a person that can um, be videotaped. And the reason why I say camera turned off, that is very important. It is not because it's synchronous learning, but when you are requiring students to kind of upload videos for um, a project, they cannot be, I've had students who could not be on camera at all for privacy reasons. Um, given the situations that they were in in the countries that they were living in. I've had students ask for more writing samples. Um, so it really does set a more personalized learning experience for the students. And it allows them to ask questions and make comments in a safe space. And that is very essential for all students in an asynchronous setting. Um, I do want to move on to the second component, which is really diversifying the curriculum perspective, okay? This is very important. We talk about um, many of the students who opt to take asynchronous classes. They're coming from different backgrounds. They have different learning styles um, and they live in different environments. Um, I have had students who have been taking my courses from Korea and China and English is their third language. I've had students who are dyslexic or have ADHD. Um, I've had students who are in their third and fourth career and are looking for simplicity in the teaching style. So the first bubble that you see really focuses on making sure you have a toolkit. And having a toolkit as a professor in an asynchronous setting is essential because you wanna be able to provide options for your students and for yourself because you're gonna be presented with so many different challenges. You're gonna get emails, you're gonna get um, pings from your students about oh, I can't, I don't understand this perspective, or um, I really want to provide a comment in the, on the discussion board, but I don't know how to express it without my words being lost in translation. You will get that a lot of the times. So making sure that you're meeting your students where, you, where they are, um, whether it be WhatsApp, or on the discussion board or social media or incorporating different tools to know that you are accessible, but also that they can um, communicate with you in a way that they feel comfortable. Um, the second bubble is really focusing on the human elements in asynchronous learning. One thing about engagement is that, and I think that I've hinted at it before, is making sure that there is a human um, interactive component. So really building in a synchronous 
or in-person elements in your um, asynchronous course. That is essential. So whether it be synchronous office hours, whether it be in-person group activities where the students have an opportunity to interact with each other in person, um, or even uh, uh, a telephone session, if that is possible. I think that hearing a real life voice, seeing real life people is essential in an asynchronous course. And then the last bubble, Many of you have heard of UDL, which is basically the universal design learning principles. And um, what I've touched on before really are elements of universal design learning. But what I do want to point out is um, the action and the expression principle of universal design learning. Um, when it comes to action and expression principle, um, this is going to be important for you as a professor because it tells you how the students are learning in your class in real time, right? Because you are not there when they are clicking onto the units, because you can't see their expression or notice their confusion. It is essential that you provide not only options and communication, but you embed a guide on how to set goals on what they're learning and how quickly they're learning it. So providing a checklist, um, customizing um, a feedback tool um, that really tells you in a timely fashion how your students are receiving your material and how they are um, really internalizing it. It allows them to uh, self-reflect, it allows them to self-monitor, and it gives you a gauge on whether the materials that you have presented make sense to most. So providing checklists, Having reflective uh, assignments like journal entries really help in creating um, a space that is safe, but also tells you how your um, students are learning. I feel like I've been talking a little bit and I, I really do wanna hear a little bit from you all before I go into innovative use of emerging technology. So I'm going to pose two questions to you all. How many people have used emerging technology tools in their courses? And two, what are your favorite ag tech tools and why? You can drop your answers in the chat and I'm going to read a few um, as they come in. Um, I do have a question here as you guys are typing in your um, your responses. I think this is from Chamila. I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name. It says, do you use a grade tracking sheet such as an Excel sheet for the classes that students can keep track of their progress? Um, that's a very great question. I work in Canvas, which already has a built-in grade tracking um, system. Um, and it allows me to track how they are doing throughout the course. And it also allows them to track and see where they are in the class. Um, but I also do set up in the Canvas system um, checklists. So they can realize, hey, before I get to this point, I need to um, complete this assignment or, oh, I'm missing um, a project that was supposed to be submitted um, two weeks ago. Um, so I, I do provide a checklist within the Canvas system that allows them to go step-by-step step and make sure that they are not only completing every assignment, but um, it lets me know um, where they are and if they're missing certain concepts, because if you're skipping over certain things, you're not getting what I think you should be getting in the course. 
All righty. I am going to go to the chat and see Canvas and Polls, Kahoot. That's a that's a popular one. Uh, Canva, Kahoot. These are all popular ones. Yes, Wix and Canva, VoiceThread. That, that's a good one. Canvas Studios, Padlet, of course. Um, Brightspace, okay. Panapto, yes, love Panapto. It provides captions and everything, love that. Google Arts, yes. Virtual Tours, Blackboard, um, before you guys migrated to Canvas. Yes, these are all great examples of ed tech tools and they're simple to use. I think that that is key. And sometimes that get, gets lost when people are trying to incorporate um, ed tech or emerging um, tech tools into their course, uh, into their course uh, curriculum. So let's hop into the innovative use of emerging technology. Um, you know what, I can't express enough how important uh, certain emerging technology tools are in providing an inclusive and an accessible education in an asynchronous setting. I know that many of you have been inundated and overwhelmed by the discussion of generative AI and its tools in education. I'm pretty sure of that um, because there has been so much talk about it, so much worry about it when it comes to cheating um, in um, higher ed. But I do wanna start there when we're talking about using basic generative AI tools in your courses. I think that you should not run from it because generative AI, first and foremost, is here to stay. But it's also very useful when you're trying to create an inclusive and accessible online education environment. And the reason why it's useful is because it really speaks to um, students in your class that may have language barriers. It speaks to students who may be um, visually or uh, visually impaired um, or have learning disabilities because it provides text to speech. It translates um, information in real time for these students and they can use it in conjunction with what you provide. So it, I personally do not run from it. I instead put um, or provide them with guidelines on how to use it when they are going through the units in my course. So they have to cite everything. They have to um, ensure that they double check that what they are um, submitting is actually truthful because some of the generative AI tools provide information that is not somewhat, that is not true. So really incorporating the use of um, these AI tools is going to be essential when you're talking about asynchronous um, courses. And so I say, don't run for, from it, use it, um, and because it can really, really be helpful and to you and to your students. Um, the next thing that I wanna jump into are online collaborative platforms. Um, and I've mentioned it before, um, you have tools like Padlet, you have tools like Hypothesis, which is um, very prevalent in Canvas that allows you to do um, annotation um, and have a discussion um, about uh, documents that you are asking your students to annotate in real time. You have discussion boards, you have Flipgrid, you have so many um, collaborative platforms that allow your students to engage with one another when they have time to do it. And these are fairly easy to use and usually are accessible through the LMS. 
right? Either Blackboard or Canvas, depending on what you use. Um, these are tools that really promote collaboration, human touch from a distance um, through its collaborative research, brainstorming and mind mapping. The last aspect of innovative, useful emerging tech in um, higher ed, when we're discussing asynchronous learning, are virtual manipulatives. Some of you may have heard of it, some of you may not have. Usually this is a concept that is really seen in K through 12 settings um, and usually in math and science settings. However, higher, higher ed really is starting to benefit from some of these virtual manipulatives that we are seeing. And it's basically, these are tools that are, that allows your students to really visualize an abstract concept. So think about chemistry, subjects like economics or biology or statistics that have really complex concepts, but it allows them to see um, virtual molecular structures or supply and demand curves that will help your students to make sense of the information that is provided. And we're starting to see a growing trend of virtual manipulatives that are a lot more complex and advanced being used in higher ed. I think one prime example of it is when you think about medical school students and they are, um, they may be learning a course about surgery and they want to, uh, you will see the students really trying to adjust um, the, the, the graphs or the simulations to really adapt to the situation given to them. It really does promote active learning and it is a way to get around some of the expensive um, interactions or the expensive tools when you're talking about augmented reality or virtual reality headsets that um, some students really don't have access to. So really consider virtual manipulatives. I have a video here, but it's very elementary but I do want to show you all how it's used in a classroom set setting. And like I said before, you normally see it when people are teaching mathematics. Hi, this is Maria from theteacherschool.com. And I wanted to address a problem that I'm hearing from a lot of math teachers these days, which is how to use manipulatives when we're doing remote learning. So. We have been so great as math teachers, pulling in Unifix cubes, dice, spinners, blocks, anything that we can use to make math real. Kids have to hold math in their hands before it makes sense to them abstractly. And we've been doing a great job with that. And then along came mandatory uh, remote learning. So I wanted to do a quick video about ways that you can incorporate virtual manipulatives into your Zoom or Google Hangouts or Google Meets, or I don't even know what it's called anymore. <laughs> Sorry, Google. The way you can incorporate it into your online remote learning sessions. And I have three ways that you can go about it. So first we're gonna just start with a virtual whiteboard. I'm using bit paper right here. And I I'm using bit paper to just show you how you can create your own virtual manipulatives on a whiteboard. So for example, you might make um, a virtual manipulative. I pick the color red, I'm going to pick this shape here circle, and I'm, I might use it to make two sided counters. Two sided counters are great for exploring integers, positive and negative numbers. So the reds usually some signal negative one and the yellow signal positive one. 
And that's one way to make your own virtual manipulative. Another um, virtual manipulative that I use within uh, create and manipulate within something like bit paper is to take to take a shape like a triangle and you can manipulate it, move it around, that kind of thing, um, rotate it. Um, I don't want to show you the full video, but this is very, very elementary. Um, there are a lot more advanced virtual manipulatives, but I do want to show you how easy it is to incorporate it into your course work when you're presenting um, units um, for your course. So it's it can be more uh, far more interactive than this, but it does prompt active learning for your students. So I have said a lot, um, and I know some of you are wondering, how do you remember some of the lessons that you have acquired along the way? Um, in my seven years, I always keep four things in mind, and I, I remember it via the acronym CHAP. The first letter, which is C, is check in as often as possible. When you are developing your course um, and you're developing your units and you're thinking about ways that your students are going to communicate with one another, you always have to keep in mind that you need to check in with your students, right? Whether it be via email, the discussion board, um, uh, making sure that you're giving them as much feedback as possible when you're grading their assignments, um, just so you can make sure you always are doing a pulse check with your students, where they are, how they're doing, what they need, um, and it allows them to know that you are there, that you see them, you hear them, and that you do care about how they are learning and progressing in your class. Two, have a synchronous option. As I have always said, that is very, very important. Just because it is an asynchronous course, it doesn't mean that the human element is taken completely away. So making sure that you give and you built in an option for in-person or synchronous um, learning or interaction really provides and, and, and creates a setting that is safe um, for your students. The A in chat, it goes to anticipating common needs. One thing about being an asynchronous professor, you have to think and anticipate every, about every student that could possibly take your course. Do they have learning differences? Do they have a language barrier? Is there a visual or a hearing impairment? Um, do they, are they in a safe environment? Um, do they have access to some of the resources and tools that you are proposing or that you are implementing or incorporating in your course? You have to anticipate all of those possibilities when designing your course to be inclusive and accessible. And then the last thing is the P and that is patience. One thing about um, teaching um, online specifically asynchronously is really being patient with yourself and with your student because it takes time to really learn about what your students um, really um, connect with, um, how they connect. And a lot of times it is trial and error. And what has worked in a previous course sometimes does not work in the next year's uh, um, class. So really making sure that you're patient with yourself, you're flexible with how you interact with your students and that you have that toolbox just in case um, certain things pop up. So with that said, that was it for me. I really do wanna hear some of your questions. I've been seeing some of the questions in the Q&A. 
Um, but if you do have any questions, please right now pop them in the chat or in the Q&A um, section and I will start to answer them. But I do wanna thank you all. I do have resources. I have a resource slide, citation slide that I do wanna share with you all. And hopefully Amina will be able to email it to all of you all to really get a gauge on asynchronous learning. They provide um, and go into some of the tips that I have presented today. And you can also reach me on LinkedIn or via email um, with both my personal and my um, college um, email. But now going into the questions. First, I'm going to start with Susan. Um, she says, Professor Blake, thank you for reminding us to provide ways we can understand what asynchronous students understand. Do you use things other than checklists, i.e. formative assessments? If so, what are your favorite forms? Um, I For right now, actually, Hypothesis is great. It actually, Hypothesis is a, a web annotation tool. Um, and I described it in the um, presentation, but for me, it really allows me to understand how my students are really grasping the material, if it doesn't make sense, if the material isn't currently relevant, right? Because sometimes I will design a course and I will say, hey, read this, this is relevant. It, it goes great with the unit. And while it was relevant maybe three months ago, it may not be as relevant and relatable now. So I think that um, whether it's checklists, whether it's guidelines, whether it's assessments or even forums, um, I think that making sure that you're uh, you're giving a space for your students to really express themselves the best way they know how, um, whether it be via writing or video or um, text message. Um, I think that that is, it can work either way. Um, I don't necessarily have a favorite, but I do notice that hypothesis is a great form for me to connect with my students and really get them to come out of their shell and express what how they feel about the material. Um, how can, Bob, this is Bob Goldberg, how can a virtual manipulative be used in a composition course? Yes. And how can it be used in a asynchronous class? Yes. Um, virtual manipulatives in composition courses are much high, harder because usually virtual manipulatives are used for complex concepts and courses like economics and biology and statistics and chemistry, where you want to see and visualize what you're learning. When you're talking about a composition course, you know, it's creative in a way, but it's much harder to do because um it's, it's not one set concepts. So um, I would really have to look into that. I haven't really thought about that much. That's a great question, Bob, but I will look into it and, and try to see. Um, the second part of your question is how can it be used in an asynchronous class? Um, these types of manipulatives, you can assign as a part of a unit. Um, you can have them formulate uh, a virtual, uh, their own virtual manipulative, and then have them submit it to you um, via the LMS. And that's how you would use it. Um, you can also make sure that it's open enough where students can comment on it. Um, and, and, and it will help actually the, the student that formulated the virtual manipulative to think critically on how they crafted it. So I think that it's it's many ways that you can incorporate it in an asynchronous class. Um, but yes, the student would have to do it on their own first and then get the feedback from 
uh, it, their peers and from the professor. Andre, what tools can be used to track students' progress or interaction with the content? Other than the checklist, um, like I said, there are many tools in Canvas and in Blackboard that can help you track the progress, right? Yeah. You can um, set up, you know, the way I do it is that I, I set up different check-ins um, in each of the units. So I will have um, a quiz or I will have a reflective journal or I will have um, uh, a, a video requirement and component or an office hour component at least once a semester that allows me to track how the students are really progressing and whether they're interacting with their peers or not. Um, and all of these things are open to the students in the course, right? So it's not just, oh, I'm able to see it, but their peers are able to see it and comment accordingly. So I think that that is the best way, to, but I can't say specifically what those tools are because I don't know what your LMS is. Um, and it could look different depending on um, what system you're using. Um, Emily McGee, love chat. Can you give some examples of synchronous options that you recommend? Um, I think that I, I, I have kind of gone over that a little bit. I know that I require all of my students to have a Zoom office hours with me. And I actually uh, have group Zoom office hours. So I have, I, have, I have students in all different time zones. And usually if one student is requests a time to meet with me and they're in uh, the Pacific time zone, I will find another student who is in the Pacific time zone and say, hey, I'm available at this time. I, I definitely inform them that this is going to be a group office hour session. And the reason why it's a group office hour session is because I want you to learn and hear from your peers and I want them to learn and hear from you. So I think that that is a basic option that I think all professors can uh, accommodate to. And it usually works because sometimes that's the first time that they're able to speak to their peers and me um, and it allows them to feel like, oh, I'm heard, I'm not in this course by myself. Um, and some of the same questions that one student has, the other student has too. So that's one simple one. Um, Tara Perrin, thanks so much for this. I'm writing a module in belongingness course being designed for faculty and your information couldn't be more timely since my module is specific to asynchronous courses. Do you have any specific resources you strongly recommend? Like I said, I have resources and citations that I do want to share with all of you, and it's on um, the slides that will be shared with you. So you will have access to those resources, and I think that they would really be helpful in your um, belongingness module. So good luck with that. Um, to clarify, resource for faculty to learn from in regards to belongingness. Yes, that's also included in those citation um, resource lists that I showed before this slide. So this, that will be, they are specifically tailored for faculty and professors. So and please let me know if you have any questions after you look through the list, you can always email me and I can provide any more if you need it. Um, am I missing any more questions? How often is ideal to check in with students taking asynchronous courses as a group? Yes, 50 to 100. Typically do so once a week, um, end of each week, but no student acknowledges any of these messages and announcements on Blackboard. I don't want to overwhelm students with messages. Would it be useful to send individual students emails 
even if they are not struggling to inquire about how they are doing, again, I don't want to disturb the students. Yes, and I think many, many um, professors run into this, whether they're teaching a course, uh, an intro course that is huge or smaller seminar courses that have 10 to 15 people. I think that checking in should not be once a week if you have a big class like that. I think that you should state at the onset that every student is required to have one Zoom session with you, one interaction, whether it be email, to update you about how they are doing in the course. And I think that that should be before the midterm, right? Um, and that's how I usually do it. I, I require the check-ins to be before the midterm, just so I know um, how the students are doing before that critical grade. Um, I, I think once a week is a lot. Once a week is a lot, whether you have a small class or a big class. I would say um, from the time the course starts at, to the midterm, it should be a mid midway point there, maybe a month or so after the course starts, um, making sure that you have heard from at least 50 to 60% of the course, uh, um, uh, the students in the course. And if you haven't, then that's when you can send out a reminder email for those who have not yet checked in with you. Fantastic. Thank you so much for getting through all the questions um, and for your fantastic presentation today. <clears throat> Thank you everyone for joining. Again, the slides were shared in the chat with you. We'll also be sharing out even more resources as well as the recording. Um, so you'll be able to come back and revisit. And I hope you go back to the agenda page and catch our last run of sessions for today and you enjoy the rest of summit. Thank you everybody for joining.